okay yeah so yeah uh, sorry for the inconvenience team so yeah in this chapter as an intro form we will we have we will be seeing uh, how we are going to train the models so while training the model what happens in the back end so that part uh, we should be uh, uh, wearing the internals behind that part so that's the core part behind this chapter and so while training a model uh, we will be feeding the data and we will be uh, feeding the labels corresponding to if it is supervised learning uh, so the data can be uh, since we can we can see it as a data but before feeding to the model we can say it as a feature so we will be uh, feeding in the model with a feature and on the label then the training part happens at the end of the training we will get some model that will predict some something good so while doing this uh, how can we say that uh, this model has learned uh, something better or how can we say that uh, this model is really learning or uh, how can we make the model actually to learn so these kind of questions we have uh, this kind of uh, analytical uh, this kind of question and we get answers for these kind of questions in this chapter so uh, so far we have treated uh, machine learning models and training algorithms like black boxes we don't know that without uh, we are just uh, input uh, input if it is scikit learn we are just a dot fit method that's it then everything is done so uh, then what is really happening in the backend so those kind of things are we will be exploring here so uh, if it is a linear regression model so what happens in the linear regression model uh, there is a equation uh, familiar most familiar equation y equal to mx plus uh, b so it's a equation of a line so we can say the same uh, in matrix notation y equal to x theta uh, x transpose into theta so uh, it's a, it's a, it's some matrix multiplication then finding the value of the theta theta is the actual parameters that we want to find so solving the value for theta that's the training of that's called training the model so using matrix we can find it so that is called direct closed equation form if we, if we solve like that there is another way called iterative uh, optimization iterative approach called gradient descent so this is another way and within gradient descent we have some other ways yeah then nextly uh, polynomial regression so this is to handle the to capture the non linear features to ha having the complexities in learning the features from the data okay so uh, if we use the uh, non linear uh, kind of stuff to learn a linear uh, regression pro problem uh, there is a chance that overfitting it may learn it may memorize the features as is so that's called overfitting so we will be looking in detail shortly then how to avoid them so using uh, regularization techniques that's another one that we will explore shortly those kind of stuff then yeah uh, so uh, in our chapter 1 we have uh, seen one problem uh, finding the uh, income of the particular uh, particular particular cities um, hi yeah um, so in here uh, uh, the model of the life satisfaction this is some other one. Uh, another problem we, uh, so here theta not theta 1 into gdp per capita so this is one feature and for this we have the two parameters theta not and theta one so theta not is uh, said to be bias and uh, theta one is the uh, parameter yeah okay can you uh, move to the next page please um i have a question please in the previous page yes sure please go ahead yeah. so um is, is a, a little bit dumb question um what That's do they mean fine. when we, we are what, learning what they together say, yeah please don't what, don't hesitate yeah. what does that mean by saying direct closed form what does it mean closed form equation means uh i can explain so yeah, we can actually uh, get to a finite answer with with the help of mathematical i mean linear algebra equation 
we typically call it as a closed form solution. So you precisely know that there's a number. Just to uh, keep it simple. Yeah, if you've if you've learned about stochastic gradient descent, and we will later on in, in this class, but many people are already familiar with that, um, and and that is not a closed form. So there, you're you're tweaking the parameter and then seeing if it get if, if the error is better, and then you tweak it a little more and 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 find out and and just keep doing that until you get the best value. So that's that's the stochastic gradient descent approach, but and that's what we'll use in most problems. But he's showing us in this book, uh, in this chapter, we're learning also that some problems, linear problems, uh, can also be solved directly without using any kind of iterative technique, just directly from linear algebra, as uh, the, the previous uh, comment mentioned. Yeah, uh, adding to this point, in other way, uh, adding to this point, uh, in gradient descent, we have to uh, iterate through the features several times. So it's like uh, some trial and error approach. We will start with something, and then we may or may end with the uh, optimal uh, parameters, but we will be somewhat near up to that. But in the direct closed form, we will directly obtain the optimal solution. Okay, uh, that you. is in some, some computations. So yeah. Uh, so here we can find that uh, the linear regression model prediction, it can be modeled like this. So y hat, it's a predicted value y hat has uh, theta naught plus theta one x plus theta theta two into x two uh, theta up till theta n into x n. So the number of features and each parameter uh, parameter for each uh, then bias adding the bias to that. So uh, n is the number of features, the ith feature value, and this is the model parameters. So in shorthand, it is in vectorized form, it is represented like this. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, if uh, if we say theta, then it's a model's parameter vector. If it is a x, then it's our uh, parameters, sorry, uh, features. Uh, we have, uh, for our machine learning model to train, we have some uh, n number of uh, samples, input samples. So the, our input samples, uh, we, have to, uh, we have to find the value of theta such that uh, it is generalized. It is generic for all the input samples that we have. Yeah. Uh, for uh, we may have some hundred examples. So for hundred examples, uh, if you put one example here, we may get some predicted value. And for the second example, we may get some predicted value. For third example, we may get some predicted value. So that uh, what we will get is. Yeah, uh, so that uh, we will get some uh, n number of, uh, for example, for 100 examples, we will get some 100 predictions. So what we have to find it, optimal value of theta, so that the difference between the actual value and the predicted value is minimal. So that's the goal. So in a, uh, our goal is to find the value of optimal value of the theta, so that the difference between the uh, uh, predicted value and the actual value is less. Then. If so, then how we are going to measure it, measure them? That's another point. Uh, if, if we say that uh, uh, I have some 100, example, 100 samples and I am framing this equation, so with what values of theta I can give? That's the first question. So for that question, and uh, in, what, uh, in what way we can measure it, whether my model is really performing well or not? For those kind of questions, we are using the cost function. Yeah. Uh, Just a question here. Uh, I mean, like, uh, yes, please. the question may not be from the context of, I mean, present in the current chapter, but I think uh, 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 makes sense again. So uh, does uh, anyone, uh, I mean, there's a lot of heuristic uh, rule of thumbs for this, question, for this question, but I want to understand like, is there any paper or a mathematical way of measuring the amount of data required for building an ML model? Uh, uh, my question pertains to primarily the structured machine learning model. I mean, if anyone can answer this, um, if there's any reference, uh, I would like to probably see into it. Yeah, thanks. So the question is is a uh, is a good one. It's it's uh, 
it's a, really an, a more advanced question, but you're asking how many examples, how many, how big does our training set have to be in order to uh, solve our problem? Is that, is that what you're trying yeah. to ask? Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. Um, so um, th this depends. One thing it depends on is, is uh, how accurately you want your model to, to be. Um, you know, so, cause you can see that if you look at the mean squared error, this uh, equation 4.3, the, at the lower right hand side, it, it, uh, the, well, no, it's sorry. M is the, yeah, M is the number of examples and M is the number of training uh, data points. Right. And so, um, let's see. Uh, yeah, I, I really, I think we should wait. Uh, we'll see how this question gets answered, but not in, not in this chapter, I don't think. I think it's a little bit later on where they've got yeah, some. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, research problem. The question that he asked is that it's a very good uh, research problem. And uh, uh, just for, uh, for, uh, for any problem, uh, we can say that uh, for any data set, we can say that it will reach some normal distribution over some period of time. Uh, so uh, it, it may not be the correct answer, but relevant answer. So if we, uh, once the data, fra uh, once the data that we have that resembles the uh, general population, then I think that will be the some optimal set. Okay. But you would never know. Sorry. I should drill down a little bit into the first two equations on the left hand corner, uh, left hand side of the page. So we have a, a standard equation for a linear model um, uh, theta one, x one plus, you know, wh however many terms with the uh, theta naught. Uh, which they're saying is the bias term. Um, going down to y hat, and my understanding is that y hat is the predicted value of something whenever you have that hat on top of something. Yeah. Equaling yeah. h naught, uh, sorry, h of theta of x. So you're taking y equals f of x, and instead you're saying y hat equals h theta of x as a, as an equation, uh, as a function and H theta to my understanding, uh, cause I had to kind of look it up is the hypothesis function, you know, where that basically that H theta represents your model. Okay. This is whatever model you're using. That's H theta. It acts on the data X to give you predicted value Y. Does anybody is 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 that agreed? Do we can we all agree on that? Is that does that make sense to everybody? Because that's my understanding of what that says. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That's correct. Yeah. Here it is. Yeah. The HR so theta is the hypothesis function using the model parameters theta. All right. So okay, can I can I just add something? So there was there was a good comment actually in the chat. Um, cause like, I think when, uh, the fellow, he asks about the, the, the size of the training data set, how big does not encompass how good, uh, your data. And, you know, so like, uh, and then that's true, Raquel, you know, so like, uh, talking about the training data set, um, you know, ha having it large doesn't mean that it's a good data set. No, that's always true. I mean, uh see um, i mean i understand that piece, but the question that i've asked does not have to uh, necessarily saying that should i be collecting more data in order to improve my model but uh, my question is the other way around what is the minimum data required to solve a particular machine learning model so wow. that that's that's my question i'm just trying to clarify sorry if yeah yeah in my experience it's been if you're working with like a classical machine learning model like a linear regression you can get by with maybe like tens of records, um, but if you're moving on to something more more complicated, like a, a neural net of some sort, then you might need, you know, thousands. Um, it's just that's usually been my rule of thumb. I don't know if anyone else has other rules of thumb. Yeah, thank you. So I'll, I'll give you my uh, my rule of thumbs that I've seen is. It again, uh, it depends on the complexity of the model. For example, for the linear regression kind of an equation for every independent uh, continuous independent variable uh, we need to have like 30 records 
and for every categorical column for each category we need to have like around 20 15 to 20 records so that's what my rule of thumb has been but i can't uh, i mean i can't extrapolate to every part of a model okay can i can i just clarify something so, so here so here if you want to so if we're talking about all different uh, kind of data I mean, I mean, the, the, the training data sets can be as small as it gets. You want it to be just a single data point that you want to, I mean, not, not like when I say a single, like a single of, um, like think of it like as a row, for example, just like one sample. If you just want to give it to one sample, you can do that. And then you want to, so that's the thing. And again, that, that's really, um, yeah. So, so if we're talking, so what's the right size? That also, as was said, like depends on the models, maybe, you know, some models would like really, for example, some models would really require a lot of data sets. That's why, for example, in tabular data, uh, like just decision trees are like, uh, like uh, actually, for example, a decision tree would, would, would require a lot more, a bigger training data set, for example, than, uh, than, than, than another thing, than, for example, than, than just linear regression. So, um, so yeah, so I just wanna, I just wanna share that the training set can be like as small, the training data set can be as small as one sample and it can be as big as, as you know, as your data set is. There is a rough a answer to your question. There is actually a, a, a more exact answer to your question uh, about how many data points do you need to train a model in the case of, of linear regression. And that turns out to be uh, you need at least the number of data points equal to the number of features. Otherwise, you will not get a good solution uh, because this is a linear algebra problem. And uh, in order to get uh, a good solution, you have to have at least as many features as you have, sorry, at least as many data points as you have features. Uh, and if you have more data points, that's even better, of course. But the minimum is, is the number of features. Joseph, I mean, I... I mean, I understand like where you're coming from. If I want to solve and I mean, like if an equation has an unknown parameters and if I want to solve it, I need to have like n uh, equations. But, yes. when, but let's say my n is arbitrarily very large and I can yes. use a uh, descent to sort of yeah, form it's very difficult. Yeah, if you can use you can use gradient descent, and then when you use gradient descent, it's possible to get a solution with with many fewer parameters than you have uh, 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 many fewer data points than you have parameters. But if you're using the uh, direct linear model like we are here in these normal equations, uh, in in that case, you you do have to have the number of uh, you know the number of data points equal to at least equal to the number of parameters. Yep. Honestly, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, and uh, I don't know, like, um, uh, in uh, Jeremy has debunked the idea that uh, you need a huge amount of data to solve deep learning problem. So does that also hold for classical ML? Well, that's what we're talking about. The deep learning problems are always solved by uh, some variant of, of gradient descent, right? And as Jeremy points out, you can have huge numbers of parameters and you can still get a good solution if you're using gradient descent. But what I'm trying to say here is that when we're using a linear model and when we're using the normal equations, so we're getting a closed form solution uh, like we're doing at the first part of chapter four here, uh, then you do need to have at least the number of data points equal to at least the number of features. That, that's all I'm saying. Yeah. So the number of points, so uh, yeah, uh, which sounds good. So uh, can we do uh, can we do this uh, cost function analysis now? Yeah, we can. We can. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is just going back to your algebra class when you did uh, you know n equations and n unknowns. You can't if somebody gives you three equations uh, in four unknowns, you can't solve it, right? Um, yeah. uh, and and so and that's what that's what we're doing by these algebra algebraic you know linear algebra techniques. You have to have at least the number of uh, uh, equations equal to the number of features. But uh, if you're using stochastic gradient descent, uh, as is mentioned, you can get a solution without having that many data points. So shall I proceed now? Uh, 
Uh, please go ahead. Yep. So uh, once we are defined this uh, uh, y hat, uh, like so, usually we will uh, initialize the theta with some random values. Uh, then we will find the uh, we will find it as as uh, as we go through our computation. Okay. So during the training process, how do we check that whether the model is uh, the really learning something? So to to make it check to to check that we have a cost function. So the cost function is nothing but the difference between uh, something that simulates uh, difference between uh, actual and the predicted. So uh, that's what the cost, uh, cost function defines. Okay, I'll see. Somebody needs to mute themselves. We meet everyone. So the task function actually uh, here uh, here it is the predicted part and this is the actual part. So in any cost function we will see that there will be some compar the comparison difference comparison between actual and the predicted. If the difference is uh, zero, then our model is predicting perfectly. If the difference is uh, somewhat uh, higher, then uh, Accordingly, we can say that hey, this model is not pouring, this, not, this is preparing, we're doing well, this is not doing well like that. So, if it uh, in the previous chapters, we have seen that uh, absolute difference, then squared error. Similarly, uh, here we are uh, uh, saying that mean squared error. So, uh, squared error means we have this is called the error term. We are squaring this error. So, this is called squared error. And we have some 100 samples, means we are taking the mean of the samples sorry mean of the errors so it is called mean squared error yeah so yeah i have a question yes please um this place where they said in practice it is simpler to minimize the mean squared error than uh rmse and it leads to the same of the law so um uh why they say it is easier because in the previous chapter we discussed that the, we use rmse if uh, the data it's noisy, and uh, we use the other one, MSC, if it is not noisy. But uh, why here are they just choosing MSC without any taking okay. that into consideration? Yeah. Yes, I got the question. Yeah, uh, and is, if you it's just saving you the it's just saving you the computation of a square root. Yes. Um, you know the mean means the uh, the mean squared error. Uh, when you minimize the mean squared error, it's the same thing as minimizing the root mean squared error because they're mono, they're both monotonic. I mean, they both tr vary the same way, right? Uh, x squared varies the same way as yeah uh, as yeah uh, as the square yeah. root of x squared. Yeah, I, yeah. I understand. They just give the same result, but for us to choose either of the two, we need to have uh, uh, because we need to choose which. Uh, 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 which one to use before so we just choose them randomly no it's so, it's purely it's because easier. of what what you want the 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 reader to get if you want to present the error in a form that's easily understandable then you choose rmse because that tells you like the units like if you're measuring distance for example the root mean squared error is going to have the same units as the distance yeah. and it's easier to interpret okay i think there's another reason with the mean squared error you still have the square on the top so when you take a differential, you'll end up with x plus differential is going to be 2x. And that 2 and the denominator is 2 kind of get cancelled. I remember reading that somewhere. So that's why you kind of prefer mean spread error when it comes to like within distance solutions and those kind of when you're trying to optimize your loss. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's the two points. Uh, is one point is uh, saving some. Uh, if it is a square, is a root mean square, then we need to do some uh, floating point operations, floating point computations. So yeah, that yeah. squaring and that computation efficiency, that's uh, as uh, Joseph said, uh, that's one point. Then another thing is, yeah, uh, as uh, I, I don't know its name, sorry. So uh, finding the derivative uh, when, if it is the square root, uh, sorry, absolute difference or some square. Uh, finding its derivative is somewhat, uh, it's not uh, defined at some point. I'm sorry, uh, if it is uh, absolute, then uh, 
Okay. Yeah, so, I'm so, sorry, sorry for confusing. Uh, so, uh, existence of uh, derivatives has to be there the, uh, so that the gradient descent can be uh, done well. Uh, that's another point. Okay, can, can I add something, please? Yes, please. So, so, so here, this is, uh, this is uh, what we're using for the cost function, you see? So, uh, so for example, uh, this may not necessarily be our performance measure. You see? Okay, okay. So, 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 we're gonna, so, we're gonna, so we're gonna use this, for example, right? To get, uh, you know, so, so to, to go, you know, so for example, this will be our model. Okay, think of our model, maybe like a line that's gonna split, you know, like the two sets, okay? Now, now you get, for example, how accurate is your model, and the mm -hmm. accuracy there is your performance measure. So let's just be clear on that, that. That's all, you know. And so, so here, really, if you use exactly as Joseph said, it's just a computation here. We didn't take the root. Um, yep. Yeah. Okay. Obrigado. Are ready to move to the next page? Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, yes, okay. Please. Yeah. So, uh, the previously we have seen that uh, y hat equal to uh, theta dot x. So, that uh, that equation, so uh, as per the mathematical uh, finding, the when we solve for the inverse of the, when we solve for the theta, we will get this equation. So, x transpose x. So, it's uh, here we can find that this x, uh, what uh, the, to find this value of the theta, we need just uh, our feature, our features, and our uh, labels. So here, in one shot, we can find it everything. And the complexity is the uh, depends on the number of exam number of samples. This computation is cost here. Yeah, uh, that's what we will uh, uh, see in the in this exam. So in this here, we can find that the uh, data is somewhat linear, and then. To compute them using the normal equation, yeah, normal. This is the normal equation, and how it comes. So uh, this is called uh, closed form equation. Uh, how it comes? So some mathematical derivations are there. That is in the appendix part of the book. So uh, that we can see uh, after uh, after some period, sometimes uh, that involves some math. Yeah. So uh, uh, the uh, yes, please. I just have a, a two comments here. One yes. is that um, you know if you're a mathematically inclined or if you're a, a physicist or an engineer, this equation is beautiful. But if you're not um, and you still want to learn machine learning, please don't get discouraged. The equation looks extremely nasty, and I understand that. Um, please don't get discouraged by this by the mathematics in this chapter. I don't think it's typical of the rest of the book. And as the author says earlier on. Uh, you can feel free to ignore the mathematics and just try to pick up the gist of what's going on. Um, try to take a bird's eye view of everything and please don't get discouraged by this mathematics if it's not your uh, forte. Um, and the second comment is the author didn't make clear what all the terms in this equation are. Um, so it's good to go over them and make sure that we understand what they are. Um, the theta, uh, I think he did make that clear. Those are the parameters of the model. So if we have a linear model, you know, uh, in the in the graph on the right, we see a linear model with one parameter. But in general, a linear model can have as many parameters as you want, as many parameters are there as there are features. And so theta has dimensions. Theta has dimensions equal to the number of features plus one, because Remember, the zeroth element, theta zero, is the bias term. Um, OK, so now we understand what theta uh, is. Theta is the actual parameters, but theta hat, as the gentleman previously pointed out, theta hat is the estimate that you get from your model, the estimated parameters from the model. OK, so that, that takes care of theta. What about, uh, what about y? Well, y is a column vector that has all the labels in it. Remember, this is a supervised training, right? So y has all the labels in it. And so those are the two that he defines. Um, but he forgot to define capital X. Uh, so what is capital X? Um, capital X is a matrix, an array, that, has, uh, that is composed of column vectors. Um, and each of the column vectors corresponds to one of the data points in your, uh, in your training data, right? So the first column will 
basically be all the features of data point one. Uh, the one twist on it is that x, the, these column vectors have an extra one tacked on at the beginning. Um, and, and that's to take care of the bias term. So, um, so x, the, the first column of x is, is uh, a one followed by all the features, all the feature values for the first data point, right? The second column of x is all the, uh, all the is a one followed by all the feature values for the uh, for the second data point and so on, right? Um, and in general, X capital X is going to be uh, an M as in Mary, M by N as in Nancy, M by N matrix where M is the number of training examples and N is the number of features that you have. So I hope that makes it a little clearer what he's doing. And then he shows this beautiful equation which bam, in one stroke, gets you the parameter estimates. All you do is feed it your data set and your labels, and out comes the, uh, the, 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 the answer. And that's what they mean by a closed-form model. You don't have to mess around with stochastic gradient descent and tweaking and iteratively adjusting and so on. Um, it's great, but it only works for linear models, and that's, that's the drawback. OK, I'll turn it back over. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so uh, the programmatically doing this, so he's uh, simulating some values for x and simulating some values for y. So uh, with this uh, x and the y, we can we are going to find some uh, find the value of theta. So to do that, we are adding the bias, and uh, we are adding we are finding the best value of theta using this only one line. So uh, np numpy dot linear algebra dot the inverse uh, inverse of x transpose into x. That's what he's done. Uh, is being done here. So uh, the, the by x x transpose dot product of x. This dot product uh, followed by another dot product with x transpose. So dot with x transpose, then followed by y. So this equation gives us the optimal parameters. Uh, here we are getting two values because uh, we have only one parameter x, and the another one is corresponds to the bias. Um, so the bias is nothing but uh, some additional noise present by default. And uh, we can think think it like, think this like when we are booking some cabs, uh, cabs or taxis, we will be getting some minimum charges, right? So we can think bias like that. Uh, whether you use or not, there is some minimum cost associated with that, with whatever it is. So that we can think think it of as bias. I I didn't get the taxis. What, were there taxis there somewhere? Yeah, yeah. If if you uh, if we if you any service, whether we use it or not, uh, if we book some if you book some taxis, uh, there are many applications, right? Uh, Ola, Uber, many things. If you book some cabs. Uh, but we we didn't use it. Use it in the sense we cancel it immediately. Then there will be some minimum cost they will put, right? So we can think bias like that. Even if all my data points are zeros, uh, at least the value uh, value why value we will get something. So we can associate bias like that. So the minimal cost associated with the uh, features. Uh, looks like some other is annotating. Yeah, I'm just writing, uh, sort of trying to annotate what this thing looks like, uh, what this uh, what this equation looks like. Um, uh, I think noise and bias are kind of should be treated differently. Bias here you can see is that the offset you're seeing on the y, right, starting almost around four. And if you draw a straight line from four, then the bias for that straight line would be four. Noise is the scattering around that line. So, and, but as mentioned before, like bias is something that even if everything else is zero, you are like incremented towards it to going one direction or the other direction. And that's what your bias is. Yeah, as uh, Joseph, uh, yeah, okay, clear it. Okay, so as you drawn, uh, so the, uh, the x here, here the x cor uh, corresponds to the shape of m cross n, m corresponds to the number of uh, examples, 
and the n corresponds corresponds to the number of features then the n we will get theta that corresponds to the number of features so we will get some uh, vector uh, it has a n uh, it's a vector n cross n uh, columns so including bias so that's what we got we get it here so uh, next slide please next next page please uh, hold on for a sec. Let me get rid of, give me back my pen. Um, okay, yeah, there we go. Yeah, uh, here uh, we have computed uh, similarly for, uh, for prediction. Once we find the best data, we can find the value of the prediction for some x values. So this is the y predicted y value. When we plot this, this red color line is what our predicted lines. So this uh, this line is computed using our uh, closed form of matrix, closed form direct solution. If we use uh, scikit learns uh, internally, it uses LSTQ uh, scipy dot linear algorithm that least squares. This this function will be called in the background. So that will give us this result. This result is computed using the same equation that we are seeing as this. Next page. Yeah, next page, please. Okay. So, uh, so uh, coming to the next one. Uh, whenever we are doing the matrix inverse, that matrix has to be uh, singular matrix. If the matrix is invert uh, for non-invertible matrices, we can't compute, we can't go this direct form of the way to make that there is something called pseudo inverse. Okay, then uh, the way that we are decomposing the matrix, uh, decomposing, uh, we have seen that uh, x, x, in, x into x inverse whole, whole transpose dot uh, y. Uh, there we, we are doing some decomposition. Uh, that decomposition is called singular value decomposition it is nothing but any matrix can be decomposed into three sub matrices v sigma and u uh, why only this is this the, the this is termed as eigen decomposition of uh, uh, matrices and uh, this this uh, mathematically they, they, it's called singular value decomposition uh, so this uh, the finding the inverse while finding the inverse, they will use uh, the singular uh, decomposition will be used. Yeah. Then uh, moving to computational complexity. If we have the matrix with uh, uh, n plus one, the n plus one is a number of features. N is a number of features and uh, uh, one plus one indicates the bias. So the normal equation computes the inverse. So here, here it is one n plus one matrix, and this is another n plus uh, n plus one matrix. When we multiplying them, the cost associated with it is the to uh, in, if we implement the matrix multiplication, the number of uh, multiplications involved will be three times uh, order of uh, n cube. So, uh, in uh, if if it is a, in a the the number of computations involved is O of n cube. Uh, that's why this method is uh, much much costly. If we have some uh, ten examples, then we may need to do at least uh, uh, um, here in of n cube. Right? So if we have the two features, then we have to do at least eight eight computations. So if we have some uh, normally in other uh, problems, then there will be more number of features we may have. So it, it is computationally, it is, it is not better to go with that. And we can't do the matrix multiplication uh, using partial way also. That's also the, uh, we, uh, it's a memory inefficient. If you have some uh, one lakh samples, some features, some, some uh, 100,000 samples, then keeping everything in memory while doing the computation, that is itself is also, uh, not a simple simple process so for our understanding this may look uh, diff simple i have a question in reality it's uh, it's somewhat uh, tedious things yeah i have a question another, another dumb question 
Yeah. So where they made mention that um, the SVD approach is more efficient than computing the normal equation, but they said plus it handles edges cases nicely. What does this phrase means? It handles edge cases nicely. Yeah. I don't really uh, yeah, understand yeah, this. Cases in the sense uh, to compute inverse of a matrix, it has to be invertible. Uh, invertible in the sense uh, it has to sorry, it has to be. Uh, singular matrix it should be in invertible one if it is singular then only it is invertible so what if the matrix is non invertible so what if it is uh, uh, it's uh, singular okay yeah I, I, uh, sorry for the confusion i, I think uh, i have swapped the terms uh, what if if the matrix computation that is uh, not invertible that is it is singular so in those cases uh, we have to add some uh, extra nice terms uh, so that it's it is like uh, we can't divide something by zero, right? So, but we can divide some number by uh, zero point zero zero one. It's like some kind of little bit uh, adding some some stuffs so that to make the computation uh, with some loss of quality. So the edge cases are uh, non-invertible matrices, and then also the case that I was talking about before, when m, the number of uh, of 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 examples, sorry, the number of data points is less than n, the number of features. Um, remember, uh, if you're just using a standard uh, approach like the first one, uh, like the normal equations, you can't solve equations like that. You have to have at least the number of equations as you have unknowns. But um, a singular value decomposition uses more sophisticated mathematics, and it can actually make an estimate of the solution, even if you have fewer data points than features. And uh, that's, so that's the other edge case that he's talking about. Um, so. I, I should also mention that uh, up until recently, um, singular value decomposition is just the standard way to go when you're trying to in invert a linear uh, problem. Um, just you don't even mess with the other one because it's, uh, you don't even mess with the, uh, the normal equation approach because, uh, you know, because it has a larger complexity. Um, so that's what people used to do up until maybe 10 years ago when computers started to be able to handle huge numbers of huge amounts of data, like he says here, data sets of 100,000 or more. And now um, SVD is no longer the, the, uh, the knight in shining armor because it bogs down. It's got an order of n squared, whereas, uh, as we'll see, this uh, stochastic gradient descent has an order of, of m. So uh, that's why stochastic gradient descent has now become the workhorse for, uh, for all these optimization problems. So the next thing is, uh, we will see the gradient descent. And uh, yeah, before uh, seeing the gradient descent, uh, I made some slides, uh, some uh, some collab notebooks. So I have shared it in the group. Yeah, uh, so can you please open that? Yes, sorry, um, sorry about that. No. Yeah, I shared it in uh, uh, Slack. Oh, you want me to open something you share in Slack? Okay, hold on, let yeah, me yeah. see. Uh, sure, I'll do that. Uh, let's see now, let's to find it. Um, uh, that guy hands on a mill, and let's see. Uh, I, um, I don't see what you shared is, oh yeah, yeah I see it. To the is, co is, it, is, it, is it this collab notebook or? Yes, yes, yes. I'm okay, sorry. okay, I'll open that. Um, let's see, I think I have to, Okay, you, you don't see it yet, right? Yeah, I can see it. Oh, you did see it. Okay, well, let me go back. So I, I was already sharing it. Um, hold on. Uh, let's see. Okay, are you seeing the collab notebook now? No, no, not, not getting it. Oh, okay. Um, let's see. Share. Uh, let's see. Collab. Optimization.ipynb. Uh, now, how about now? Yeah, it's visible now. Yeah. Fine. Okay, great. Yeah. So uh, the content is very less, but uh, somewhat uh, that I mean, Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in general, optimization problem is uh, is when we have some uh, choices, we have to find which, which choice is better for us, better for the problem. So in better means in what way it is better. So uh, whatever be the problem, optimization problem, uh, we have 
in in mathematical optimization problem we will say them as variables objective function and the constraints and uh, for example if we are going to buy in our in our day to day life uh, if you are going to buy a new television or new mobile uh, what we will see we will see that uh, whether the uh, television has this this feature does it supports some 4k features some audio features some those kind of uh, things are said to be variables and the objective function is uh, i want to buy the uh, buy some television within the price range of uh, some dollars to some dollar and some rupees to some rupees so that is our objective function and uh, constraint is it should have uh, it should be lie within that uh, budget and it should uh, it should be wall mounted it should be if it is mobile then it should supports uh, dual sim and it should support some sophisticated uh, camera facilities uh, some higher level of uh, megapixels uh, with uh, dual cameras and so those kind of things are some constraints okay uh, i hope uh, th this will be uh, somewhat adding adding some stuff yeah i hope this will be clear yeah uh, can you please click on the uh, wiki page in the all uh, the one after this one here okay yes, yes. yeah uh, here uh, the optimization problem uh, we will say depends on the uh, features that is being considered it will be said as the variables considered it will be discrete or continuous and if it is uh, I, the, the in general optimization form is uh, is written like this minimize some function subject to some constraint so this is how uh, any optimization problem will be written so in our case in our ml problems so we have to minimize our h theta of x such that uh, our cost function what is the cost function that we have that means uh, mean squared error so and and uh, that we have to minimize so we have to minimize the mean squared error subject to the condition that h theta of uh, x is equal to y so uh, that's our uh, in our in our optimization problem that is the problem that we have yeah. uh, collab notebook please yeah so in uh, then to solve that so far we have seen uh, uh, normal equation uh, direct closed form that's one then the another one is very interesting one is gradient descent optimization algorithm and uh, gradient descent uh, gradient descent gradient descent optimization means by computing the gradient we are solving the optimization problem and while computing the here we are using only first order iterative uh, one so let's uh, see the problems uh, problem in the uh, section below find the x which produces the minimum of the function so this is some function to find the to find its minimum uh, yeah can you click on the reference link on solution one reference link please ah huh. doesn't doesn't want to find that site um ah oh, double https uh, you can oh, double the HTTPS. url i can find one more http extra https i'm not sure yeah, why it's not it's it. not it's not going there um no 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 in the url can you open the link once yeah uh, you can remove the https in the start yeah uh, https no no re remove completely uh, no. no fine remove it completely yeah oh so uh, uh, there will be some finding the maxima and minima using derivatives this is some some bit calculus so here uh, our f of x is there and x is there f of x is nothing but our y and uh, we can say this is the local maximum and this is the local minimum and this is also another uh, this is local maximum and this is another local local minimum since both are at the same level so one is local minimum another one is saddle point we can we will say like that we will kind the terms like that yeah uh, in the in the saddle points uh, in the saddle points the slope will be uh, the slope 
it will it will be there will be no much changes it will be uh, going towards zero that's why uh, it's called saddle point yeah yeah please uh, scroll down please oh sorry um fine so to find the maximum or the minimum uh, what we have to do is we have to find the first derivative so this is our uh, h3 plus uh, this is some equation a ball is thrown in the air its height at the team is given by so this is the height and this is so at, what is its maximum height that's the question if we usually we can we, if you plot this uh, plot we, if we substitute different values for t we can find the maximum value of the h so that is one way but if we only if we know the t then we can find the h so we can't uh, this is practically infeasible at all points of uh, all uh, all cost so to make the generalized solution we have to do the first we have to find the first derivative then we have to make them uh, equated to, to zero then we can find the possible values of t then we have to find its uh, second derivative then uh, when we find its uh, second derivative we can decide that it's a maximum or minimum yeah so please just scroll a bit a little bit uh, yeah so uh, accordingly we can decide that the maximum height uh, here you can find that t is equal to 1.4 so at 1.4 second the maximum height will be reached so the corresponding height that we can give it as uh, we give it as a result yeah uh, now uh, collab notebook please yeah so the those kind of steps are uh, uh, written shortly here and the same is uh, the return in the next uh, next coming upcoming cells cells yeah a bit slower we uh, move to the next cell please yeah which one this function we can find the first order derivative and the, from the first order derivative we can uh, after equating them to zero we can we can find the solution uh, uh, x is equal to zero or x is equal to 9 uh, 9 by 4 that is 2.25 these are the the points at which your maximum or minimum may occur but uh, there will be a, it will be either maximum or it will be minimum it not to both to make I have a question yes please um this yeah. is only mathematical concept for finding the maxima and minima right yes. does this apply to what we are doing in machine learning yes yes uh, we are not applying this completely Just okay. To make it understanding, I make this. Yeah, I get you. I got you. Got you. Got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so then, finding the second order derivative, we can find that. Uh, so the value is the positive value. So we can decide that it's a uh, uh, minimum value. Uh, I am not. Uh, I am not fully. I have this uh, point number five. Choosing the sign and choose the max value of max and min accordingly. If we <laughs> apply the values in the second order derivative, if we get positive value, then the point that we find is minimum point if we get the negative value then the point that we find is maximum point maximum value so for the same problem we can find using the our uh, gradient descent algorithm finding the minimum value of x uh, so that uh, we are solving that using our gradient descent algorithm so here here Uh, i am starting with x is equal to 2 sorry x is equal to 6.2 uh, i know that the optimal value of x is uh, 2.25 so i am starting with 6 then with uh, with uh, i am uh, the next time i will increase some uh, uh, i will uh, i know that the derivative of this function uh, the input function that I, i know that the input function is uh, i don't remember sorry so 4x cube something i know its derivative i know its derivative so using this derivative uh, how much i can decrease next time that i am finding it here so i am decreasing with step size of the derivative function then accordingly i am changing the value of x so once i find once the uh, step once the absolute difference is less than uh, this one uh, this loop will stop and uh, another time uh, if the maximum number of iterations is is reached then this will be stopped okay so uh, after we uh, running this to several iterations we can find that the minimum value is 2.24 here we have considered only one variable x 
in our uh, in our ml problems we have some n number of switches x1 x2 x3 x4 so here uh, here i know that the, this is a derivative function but in our case i do uh, the derivative function is some matrix computations so that matrix computations we are yet to see that yeah uh, then yeah uh, please go, go, go on to the below cell please yeah uh, can you please run uh, run from the above, from the start oh uh, let's see sure yeah uh, let's see so we're here we're here we're here let's do this oh okay run anyway Let's see. Okay. Uh, get yeah, that. Just finding the uh, what is the value of the x and the corresponding value of y. Uh, while starting, I, I did write, uh, I did initialize our uh, value with six. But in our real time scenario, in our in our machine learning problems, uh, we we will start with uh, some random values. So since here six also some random values. Are you showing the function here? Is that what the green dots are? The yes. original function? Okay. Yes, 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 original function. So the two- And then we found the, the minimum, we found the minimum is two point, two, yeah. And so it looks like it did a good job. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so this is basically the, uh, the gradient descent algorithm and the and the it's implemented here for one variable problem and the key points are you know you need the derivative yes. and you need the uh you need the learning rate which is called the step size here um that's an input and then um and then you you uh, then the, this is the key part of the algorithm where you make the adjustment to the parameter you you uh you calculate the you calculate the step uh from the derivative that's here um you multiply by the learning rate uh, to to scale it, um, and then you adjust the uh, you make the uh, you make the tweak in the parameter uh, right here, um, and you keep doing that until the uh, until you get uh, the the parameter close to the minimum, and then you stop. So that's the key. That's basically yeah. the algorithm in a nutshell. Yeah, just adding adding one more point here. Uh, so it is called a gradient descent algorithm. And to solve these optimization problems, we have n number of algorithms, and the gradient descent is one among them. We are computing derivatives, right? So that is called uh, gradient part. Uh, we, we are computing on one variable, so it is called derivative. Uh, if we compute on multiple variables, we can't. Uh, we don't have enough information to compute the derivatives. So some mathematical terms are there, partial derivatives. So those kind of things stuffs are said to be gradients. Uh, can you please move uh, one cell level, uh, go to the cell level, yeah. bit above, please? Uh, where, where, up? Part, please. Oh, gradient descent part, yeah, right here? Yeah, yeah. yes, just hold on, hold on. Yeah, yeah. so uh, the, the line that we are seeing here, so, uh, yeah, uh, line that we, sorry. The line that we are seeing here, this is called gradient update. This is called uh, gradient update, and this is called uh, gradient, and this is called the gradient update. Uh, we are uh, we are doing this iteratively. So, uh, if the uh, if if this is some sorry, uh, in our case uh, we are using the root mean square value. So, for example, if we consider uh, uh, y equal to x squared as a function. Uh, y equal to x square. So the, the function will be looking like this. If we plot them, then y equal to x squared will look like this. Uh, if if uh, x is equal to minus one, it will be plus one. If x is equal to plus one, y is equal to plus one. Then two comma four, then minus two comma four. So it will be like that. Uh, this is for y. Uh, this is for uh, the curve y equal to x square. In our mean square error. In, please remember that in our mean square error, uh, we we are computing squaring the difference between predicted value and the absolute value, actual value, ground truth value. I am I am making the difference as x now. Please don't confuse this x with uh, our features. So that difference will be x here. 
and at first when we initialize our parameters theta with uh, theta at some point we will be uh, lying somewhere in this curve at iteration 1 for example uh, just to think that if we start from here if we start from here at iteration 1 it will give me some uh, at iteration 1 i will compute the gradient first then i will up update the weights uh, update the, i will update the weights so while computing the gradient i can uh, here uh, i i will get some value it will be positive value or negative value then i will uh, i will uh, in, in there is another algorithm called gradient ascent algorithm so that gradient ascent algorithm is like starting from here finding the gradient and then move up moving up it's like it's called gradient ascent so the, uh, that we will use for when we want to maximize some value in our case uh, in our case we are minimizing and we are descending in the direction of the gradient in case if we start from the random point from here then we will be descending towards downward why we are uh, down why we are traversing in this curve because our cost function uh, because the equation for our cost function is uh, y, uh, y minus y hat the whole square uh, uh, the individual summations and uh, those kind of uh, just for the sake of easiness uh, I have removed it uh, since this is a minimizing function so our objective function is to minimize it so minimizing 2x 2x is same as minimizing the x so this constant part does not play a picture in minimizing function so whatever we see here uh, the 1 by m and some sub stuff sub, subs so those are all some constants so we are considering only the parametric part the variable in part yeah uh, i think i have given some intro uh, if yeah hello yeah back to the book yeah yes So yeah, uh, the next step will be, so we have to start uh, the gradient descent part and then uh, we, are, we are running out of time, right? Um, you, you can spend, uh, you know, a few 10 minutes to wrap, wrap up, something like that. Okay, yeah. So then coming Wednesday, then we will see this uh, gradient descent, descent stuffs. And followed by the uh, nonlinear computation, the parametric evaluation, those kind of stuff, we will see on... Uh, uh, Wednesday. So far, we have what we have, what we have seen is how we can uh, our machine learning problem as optimization problem. We are seeing our uh, machine learning problem as optimization problem. Uh, we can see our machine learning problem as uh, Bayesian optimization problem. That's a, uh, the Bayesian probabilistic way. That's another way. Uh, in, in our normal human mind, how we are uh, doing is uh, we don't have any information. We will start something. We will gain some information. Then we will add that information into our uh, uh, our progress. Then we will keep on accumulating the information. So it's like our uh, information is that's a base and that's a different part. Uh, just for uh, just for uh, th that's different part. But uh, in our uh, ML cases, we are we are approaching that ML problem as optimization problem. That's when this uh, this chapter comes into picture. For any optimization problem, uh, we need a objective function. In our case, it is cost function. Uh, apart from the optimization uh, objective function, we should have some variables and the constraints. The constraint is it should uh, fix the, the variable uh, theta should minimize. So the, it, it, it should uh, approximate so, uh, to find the value of the actual value y. Mm. Yeah, then coming Wednesday, I think we can, we are in good time. We can see those uh, gradient stuff on the various types of gradient, those kind of stuff we can see. On yeah. Yeah. I have stuff. a question, please. Yes, please. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, um, why do we add noise in linear regression, the problem? Why do we add the, that noise? What is the purpose of adding the noise? Uh, do you mean the bias? Yes. Yeah. Uh, 
Oh, you mean you, you you mean when he generated that graph um, on page uh, on the graph of uh, with all those points, right? Is that yeah. that's what you're talking about, right? Okay, so here he's just generate he's just uh, demonstrating for us that uh, gradient that these methods will solve will solve and get the right parameters even in the presence of noise. In the real world, we always have noise. You never get a perfectly straight line. You know, for a linear mm -hmm. model, you get data with noise. So he's basically just generating some synthetic, some artificial data here, and adding the noise to it, um, so that he can show you that yes, uh, even in the presence of noise, we can fit a good model and get an answer. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. Um, yeah, adding bias. Uh, another another thing is what if if all your inputs are zero mm -hmm. so the uh, we have our model y equal to x, uh, x theta dot x if our all the inputs are x uh, the, only the bias term will be having some learned values for that bias term our input feature will be one uh, then we will get that uh, bias value as the minimal value even if our okay. all our inputs are x so okay. the inputs are uh, zero null values. Yeah, does it answers? Uh, does it address? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, any questions? Any more uh, questions, please? Hey, I mean, if we if we have maybe a little bit of time, maybe we can. Uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about this a uh, little bit more about this bias and uh, and error to to make it better like so so everyone like have maybe a better image of it so for example um you, you know like um for example when you solve a single equation you have that um that intercept you know that yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, right you can yeah. you can think of it that way right okay but but then let's say now we start having more equations and then more equations and so, so mm -hmm. you, you, you know so so um so so you know like you can get to a point you, you will not have exact exact okay just plug in this instead of the x's and with you know with uh with the coefficients of the x's and then that's it you'll get the right prediction that you know that, that will not happen there and that's and that's what you're trying to get to you're trying to plug in those, uh, so when you plug in the x's, which is your data, and you multiply them by the coefficients, you're really trying to get the same y's, which we call the y hats. But, and, and that's why you want that error that you add, which is the bias, you want that to be very, very small. So, so there's just one way to kind of like think of it. Um, yeah, uh, you know, yeah, I just wanted to add that. Okay, well, let's make a distinction between error and bias, right? The bias is just the intercept, right? The error, on the other hand, is the scatter in the data. Um, if you look at the dots on that plot, um, the error is the scatter in the, let me go back to that plot. Um, so, um, yeah, sorry, I passed. Yeah, here's, so this is how he, he generates the data, basically. He's generating synthetic data that looks linear, that is, uh, that is actually generated on a linear model. And the error, when we're talking about the error, is the scatter in the data points here. Um, and he adds an error to every, um, you know, he adds the error in when he creates the data set, uh, just to show you what it looks like in the real world. Because otherwise, you just get points in a line, and then, uh, you know, it's just trivial to compute the slope and the intercept. Uh, that's not what happens in the real world. Yeah, and to just follow that, so please, like if I did say error exactly, like let's not confuse that error with the bias. Yes, so that's exactly what the error, but the bias is just like, for example, that before where that started, that, yeah. that linear graph. Which, okay. Cool. Yeah. 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 Um, I have okay. a quick question. Um, so we we use one just because um, as bias, just because for com computational convenience, right? Because we're trying to basically. Uh, make the right shape of the uh, matrix, you know. Um, yeah, we we put a one in the in the features in the features vector, but uh, the the bias is still being solved for in the model. So maybe we can clarify by going back to the equation. Uh, not is one. Sorry. 
theta naught is the bias, x zero is all one. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So uh, right, the, right. the theta, theta is being solved for. So if you look at the equation, this is uh, for one data point. And uh, so the question that Wen Cheng has is what's going on with this one so that he puts in. So let's, uh, let's draw this for a second, see what it looks like. Um, um, get my pen, so right here. And uh, so, so basically, if you look at this, it's the dot product of a vector theta with a vector x. And uh, you can think of it this way. So here's your vector theta, um, and you take it as a transpose, and then you're, multi you're taking the dot product of it with uh, the vector x, uh, where x is the feature vector, right? So this is, uh, this is theta dot x. Uh, where x is a small x, it's, it's the data point x, right? And so the way he writes this is, is theta is a vector with all the parameters in, in a linear model, you know, it's, uh, you can have more than one, you know, you can have more than one independent variable. So uh, there are a number of, that's a comma, sorry. Um, and uh, so theta zero, theta one, blah, 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 uh, to, uh, theta sub n, where n is the number of, uh, of features. Uh, so Joseph, your mic slide. has a bit of disturbance in it, I think. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, let's see, is it better now or? Uh, can you speak up? Uh, yeah. Um, can you hear me now? I think it's still there. Oh, okay. Let me see. Um, uh, it could be my Bluetooth. Um, I'm going to re. Let's see. Uh, well, let me just finish drawing this, okay? Um, and then I can work on my mic. Um, okay. Can can you hear me now, or is my mic still a problem? That's much better, yeah. Better, okay. Okay, so when you look at this equation y, uh, y hat, we're looking at, uh, we're actually looking at it in, ma it's helpful to look at the equation in matrix form, in uh, vector form here, like matrix form. So I've basically drawn this equation here um, in a as a dot product between the parameter vector theta, which is represented here, uh, Theta zero is the bias, theta one is the first parameter, theta two, theta n is the last parameter. And then the data vector, um, the, the thing that's weird here is that we're inserting a one at the beginning of the data vector. That's what's maybe confusing some people, right, Wen Cheng? Yes, yes. Yeah, so why are we doing that? Well, we're doing that because it's, because then we can represent this, this equation, which you know has, a, has the bias term, um, um, we can represent it as a dot product between these two vectors, and it's more compact to, to do it that way. So basically, you can think of this as being multiplied by one. The first term is being multiplied by one. Uh, Does okay. that make sense? When you want so a dot product here, yeah? Gotcha. So, so, so then we are adding one to every single um, no. data sample, right? Uh, yeah. we're, not at, we're not adding the one, we're just in, we're just representing, we're just sort of adding a new dimension to the data, the zeroth dimension, and the that's always going to be one. Easiness, right? If, if right. I, if, if I may add, so, so yes, I think to just add on to that, think of it even like x zero, but that x zero is one, okay? Exactly. So, so, okay. so, so, so and, where, and, where, and where is the x zero? So, for example, on the 2D plot that we saw earlier, that x zero was the four. But if you then increase the dimensions, the dimension, for example, on like maybe think of a sphere, it's just like maybe that center, that's zero, and then and then and so forth, and then you grow on the dimensions, and that's pretty much the, um, you know, uh, theta. Yeah. So yeah. So that's x zero time, which is always one times the theta zero. Yeah. So if you had like a one a one dimensional problem, you could write it as the standard equation. You know, y equals. Oh, I think I know why my microphone is distorting okay i think is it, is it better now i move farther away from the computer uh theta one 
you know, so this looks like y equals mx plus b, right? Uh, where b is the bias and, and theta one is the slope. But you can also write this as uh, y equals, uh, you could write it as y equals theta zero times x zero plus theta one times x one. So this was what Salim was saying, right? Um, so it's basically writing an, an equation that has a constant in it and replacing it with an equation that, that doesn't have a con, uh, that, well, it still has a constant in it, but it's written in a different form. Right, I, I just want to make a point because he also used numpy c, which is concatenates and it concatenates 100 ones with x vector. So that's also a very important point uh, I think we need to address. Yeah, okay, so when you construct the, okay, so this is one, this is what one data point looks like. It looks like a column vector with okay. one at the top and then x1, x2. Now suppose you have uh, a data, a whole data set, right? And so this is the point I was trying to make before when I said that um, we, we're gonna construct x as a, col as a matrix that has uh, column vectors from each example, from each data point. So we would have x, uh, the column vector from the first data point, we'll call that x1. Uh, the column vector from the second data point, we'll call that x2. I'm making this new notation where the, the superscript is basically indexing which data point we're talking about. I hope that's clear. And then uh, the last data point, um, x column vector m, m is the last data point, right? Because we have m data points in our data set. So, so this is what x really is. It's basically a set of column vectors, um, each uh, data point contributing a column vector to that, right? So, so Wen Cheng, are you with me? Yes. Okay, yes. so now what does this look like when you expand it out, right? You have a one, for at the top for each for each column vector has a one to start out right every right. element in this first row is going to be a one uh, so basically you have this whole so you basically you have to construct a vector of length uh, if well to, to make this vector to make this matrix you have to somewhere you have to construct a vector of ones and I think that's mm -hmm. what you're referring to right that's right that's right yeah. it, it, uh, except that it's kind of in, um, like it's not in this in the same shape. It's kind of vertical. Uh, yeah. yeah. So that's, yeah. that's why uh, Joseph, I was going to say that the X is actually the, it's an M by N matrix. So it's not column vectors of the parameters, but row vectors. So each example has a parameter. Let me, let me get rid of some who hasn't muted himself. Okay, um, yeah, I, I think that's better. Now, um, I believe the way he's defining X in, in this book is he's defining it this way with the column vector for each feature. And, um, X, and X transpose is the other way. Um, that may um, not work because if you look at how he defines the ones, it's 100 comma one, which means it's 100 rows of one. And if you have 100 rows of one, then it's not the way you have drawn it here because that is a single row of 100. Oh, okay, I see. I'm, I'm trying to make sense of his, I'm not looking at his equations. I'm not looking at his code, I'm looking at his equations. And he's not consistent apparently because when he starts out with the equations, um, the X's are definitely column vectors. Um, you know, uh, so, so you may have a point there that, the, um, that when you implement it in code, you have to, you have to implement the transpose of this matrix. Exactly. So that's what is maybe confusing Wenqing as well, because it's basically the thing is flipped and it's transpose. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's transpose. Yeah. So each example. Can I, can I, guys, um, I, I think what the confusion is is that what he's doing it is a column vector, but it's not a column of one. It's a column of two, where you have a like two columns one a comma b and it's a tuple where you have one comma x sub one so he's doing that because he's trying to do a matrix multiplication and in linear algebra when you do a matrix multiplication you have to have you know like 
your, your vectors have to be the same way. So if you go back into the co I did this in the collab and I typed out the shapes of the vectors. And I thought that that was really helpful because if you, if you type out like, for example, XB, um, if you type out XB dot shape, you'll get, uh, you know, a, an array of, you know, whatnot, but then type out XB itself and you'll see that there's one comma, you know, the value of X. So I think that this is just a, a hack for matrix multiplication um, that he's doing. I, I don't think it's... Are you, so are you talking about the equation? Uh, let, let me see if you're talking about the same. So there's an equation where he does, uh, let's see, X, he, he codes it, right? Um, and I'm trying to find the page where he does that. Um, it's right there. It's right there in the middle of the left-hand page you're on. Middle of, there we go. Yeah, 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 yeah. This one. See, it's this one, right? Yeah, it, or even X, N, 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 X. Well, on the top, on the top. On the oh, on the top. Okay, yeah. right. There we go. That's the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's basically, yeah, he's, he's X is the data without the ones inserted, right? And then, the, and then he has to add a column vector in front of it. And uh, it's what Srinivas said, the data is now represented as rows. This X represents each data point as a row. And then, uh, so then if you, if you construct this thing, the X underscore B, it's basically the transpose of this thing here that I showed you. Um, it's got a, um, uh, let's see, uh, NP1. No, actually it is. It's, it's exactly the thing that I've constructed here. It's, uh, no, sorry, it's the transpose. Um, transpose yeah. yeah, so, so um, yeah, XB is the transpose of this thing. So it has a column of ones. That's what this is. Um, and then the rows are the rest of the data, are all the data points. So right. that, that's what he's doing here. It's just uh, this section, he hasn't uh, been very, he hasn't explained very well what he's doing with the X's and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you, go from a, when you go from a single leg, sorry, go ahead. I, I, I just think we get, I, I mean, I, I appreciate him putting in some of the math. I think some of the math is good and it's helpful, you know, but, you know, it's, it's a sort of thing where, you know, honestly, for implementation, we're, we're coding these low level features or, low, you know, we're coding low level code to prove that it works. But I don't think, you know, you would ever use this in practice. You're going to just go to the function and, you know, input your data in such a way to, you know, go to the function unless they're, you know, as a, as a kicker in SK learn that you have to you know, include the bias term of one, you know, for the, for it to work. And maybe he's trying to show us that. I mean, we'll, we'll see if, as things go on, I just, you know, I kind of think that, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of linear algebra that none of us have. And even I don't have this. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, but I like your, I think you have a good suggestion, Stephen, is as uh, when you're going through the, uh, the notebooks to just see for yourself what the, what the dimension, what the shape of each thing is. And then, and then you can, at least we all know how to multiply matrices and so on. So we can make sure that the shapes are consistent. Yeah. And I do that with all my deep learning code. I, I mean, I have yep. to, you know, yep. see how it actually flows through and it's consistent. Yeah, yeah and and it's and always a tricky thing in the transition from a single example, which can be conveniently a column vector, to mm -hmm. going to m examples. And as soon as you go to m examples, typically in deep learning or in any other stuff, you rotate it over to have the m examples be along your rows and your parameters to be along the columns, which is what mm -hmm. typically happens. And that transition, I wish he had highlighted it so that people can see that that's what is happening rather than okay. just assuming it. But therefore, your suggestion of printing out the shapes is important and critical because you'll see that happen when he goes from a single small x, which is just a single element and therefore can be a column, to combining it into a matrix big X. And that has M rows, one for row for each example, and each row has N parameters, the zeroth value of which is the bias, and therefore gets multiplied by one. Yeah, I think uh, the author shot himself in the foot um, right over here. Let's see, uh, when he talks about, when he starts talking about linear regression, um, let me see, uh, where is, right here. Um, so the, the very first equation under here uh, where he writes, let's see, I'm looking at it in my book and it doesn't look the same. Um, hold on for a sec. 
theta.x. E, let's see. Yeah, it's th it's this first equation here where you write theta dot x. If if he would have written this as x dot theta, then then we wouldn't have had to have this problem going from x to x transpose. Um, see, I'm trying to implement this theta equals theta dot x, and so I have to write a row vector times a column vector. Do you see this, Ren of us? Oh, let me see. Somebody's got to be muted. Let me see. Uh, Joseph, you can go. remove that guy. Uh, yeah, I just did. I don't know why he keeps unmuting himself. Um, anyway, yeah. So here is uh, so here's the equation that he writes, and here's how it's implemented. Um, but it would have been much simpler if he would have just started with x dot theta, and then we would have implemented it the right way with a row vector for the feature uh, for the um, example and a column vector for uh, for theta. So um, th that's what uh, I think. That's where he he made things more confusing than they had to be. And just to add on to that, if you if you have one more um, feature, you would just pretty much numpy yeah, numpy dot c numpy ones then x then x one or x two. You know, just kind of concatenating. One more. Yeah, yeah. You um, could, you could features. definitely. I mean, this is a, a strange way to think about matrix multiplication, but it still works. It's just that it's the transpose that you're working with. Let me. Um, right. Let me go back here. So, as what you're saying, Wenching, is you could, if you had. Wait. Let me get my pen back. Uh, let's see. Is it going to give me my pen back? Uh, here. Uh, here. Okay. It's not giving me my pen back. So sorry about that. Um, the point is that Wenching was making is that you could add another another data point by just putting another column here. Uh, if you had if you had more than one data point, you could just keep adding columns uh, and putting your data points, aligning them up like this. So this matrix method here, all it is is basically a, a way of arranging your data and your parameters. And it in some sense, it doesn't matter which way you do it, but uh, as as uh, Srinivas pointed out, the standard way you do it um, in in all of data science and all of uh, optimization, the way I've seen it, is you use uh, row vectors for your data points and column vectors for your parameters. Okay. So sorry for that confusion. But um, I think we should all, some of us have a uh, good knowledge of linear algebra and, and this is no problem. Other people are looking at these equations and saying, what the hell, how am I going to make it through 800 pages 899 pages that are this dense. Um, please don't worry yourself because the rest of the book is not these. It doesn't have ugly equations like that. It's um, it's much more, much less mathematical. So if you're having trouble with the math, don't worry about it. What I would say is focus on the next part, which is the section on gradient descent, uh, which we'll cover next. Uh, which uh, Rajesh Kumar will cover next time. Uh, focus on the gradient descent, which gives you a much more conceptual way to think about it. And don't worry too much about all these nasty looking equations. That's all I can say.